Imagine that you have been given a new task at work. You have been asked to forecast the sales of a new product your engineering team has been working on for the past 18 months. Most of us who have lived the world of corporate market research have been there, come up with an accurate forecast for the new product. Hi, my name is Miklos Kremzer, founder and principal at Choice Based Market Insights, and we specialize in helping companies navigate the challenging world of new product forecasting. If you say that the challenge of forecasting new products does not cause you heartburn or other stress-related symptoms, I beg to differ. Forecasting new product launches is stressful. Most of us know that historically most product launches are considered a failure. 75% of consumer packaged goods and retail products fail to earn $7.5 million during their first year, the amount that is often the measuring stick for success. To make it more stressful, there is a myriad of unknowns. What distribution will be like? Will the budget be adequate? Is there a good understanding of the target market? In an article published by the Harvard Business Review by Joan Schneider and Julie Hall, the authors listed 40 different factors that heavily influence the success of product launches. To add to your heartburn, there is usually a significant internal pressure to provide an optimistic forecast. Think about it, your engineering team has just spent 18 months designing and producing a new product, wholeheartedly believing that this product would disrupt the industry as we know it. By the time they task you with providing the forecast, it is likely that the company had already spent millions in man hours and materials. Right now, the only thing that stands between them and eternal engineering glory is you. So hurry up. And hurry up is exactly what you should not do. In this video, I'm going to provide you with a framework for new product forecasting. I will give you some tools, steps, and even some equations, all of which will give you more confidence in creating more accurate forecasts. The very first thing that you'll have to do is ask the right questions. Is there a market for this product? Because if the answer to that question is no, or not very clear, then the recommendation must be a swift but less painful death. Now the second question must be, if yes, how big is the market? Again, if not big enough, the project must be killed, and no matter how unpopular this may make you, you must warn your organization. Only if there are signs for a big enough market should you proceed with the actual forecasting. Measuring market appeal and forecasting are two completely distinct phases in this process, and you should never skip the first phase. So first I'm going to give you some tools for the first phase, measuring market appeal. Measuring market appeal cannot happen without tapping into the market and actually asking the market about it. In other words, market research. Long gone are the days of asking survey respondents, how likely are you to purchase this product? Those are stated likelihoods and they tend to be biased. For example, if you end up with a result of 43% somewhat likely, can you turn that into a market size? What does somewhat likely actually mean? There's a much more useful approach in which we calculate market appeal or potential market size by making survey respondents choose among product alternatives. And then by analyzing choice patterns, we can set up a statistical model. This is the choice-based conjoint methodology, and there are several scientific publications that claim these methods to be less biased and more accurate. Here's how it works. First, you set up a survey-based choice experiment that survey respondents participate in. Make sure that all the relevant product attributes are included in the experiment. Then based on the respondent's choice patterns, you create a statistical model that as the next step you can use in a market simulation to measure the appeal of the product. Now this was very high level, so let's dive a bit deeper. What does this choice experiment look like? Well, let's imagine a product has three important attributes about it. For example, these important attributes may be flavor, size, and price or any other relevant attribute. For simplicity's sake, let's pretend these three important attributes are triangle, square, and circle. Each of these attributes can have different levels. In our case, let's pretend that the triangle can be yellow or blue or orange or green. In the choice exercise, we use these attribute level combinations and present seemingly random configurations as products to respondents and ask them to select the one out of these products that they would like to purchase the most. 
Although it's best to strive for realistic combinations of these attributes, most often it's fine to have as random combinations as much as we are able to suspend our disbelief. After the respondent selected an option, these options go away and another seemingly random combination of options come up. And the respondent again is asked to make a choice. Remember, this is not a product concept test, so it may not even be necessary at this phase to show the actual product you're looking to forecast. This may come as a shock to some, but we'll talk about it later. The only purpose of the choice experiment was to use these hundreds and often thousands of choices respondents make among seemingly random product configurations and be able to calculate the value or utility of every one of the attribute levels. This is where the statistical model gets calculated, a multinomial logistic regression model, often using a hierarchical Bayesian technique. Now that we have the model, we can use these utilities and simulate what the market looks like when a product is in the market. In this illustration, we imagine that the market is made up of three players, product one, product two, and product three. Using these attribute level utilities, also known as part worth utilities, we can calculate the product's total utility or total attractiveness. By exponentiating these total utilities and using the formula on the screen, we can then calculate the share of preference for each product. So what does share of preference mean? What it means is, in our choice experiment, if we had shown these three products to the respondents, 87 out of 100 people would have chosen product one, 1% 1 would have chosen product two, and 12% would have picked product number three. If we assume that our sample of respondents was representative, and we assume that all three of these products are available in the market, and everyone is aware of all these three products, and the share, then the share of preference would be very, very close to a market share. Therefore, in our first phase, where we only want to find out whether or not there's a market for your product, share of preference can tell you, in a perfect world with perfect awareness and distribution, this is the share of customers that would pick your product out of the products in the market. So this is phase one, is there or is there not a market appeal? There are quite a few steps to accomplishing phase one, using the right attributes and levels as we plan the choice task, and then designing an experimental design that is balanced and will allow for a robust model, then programming the choice task into a survey, then fielding it with a representative sample, creating an accurate statistical model, and finally, assessing the market using a simulator. The image here shows a sample simulator to assess the market appeal for online trading services. In this illustrative example, we assume the market is made up of four key players with differing attributes in their offerings. And just a side note that this example does not contain real data for confidential purposes, so no need to pause the video and scribble down the most appealing levels. So let's get to phase two now, the forecasting part. The result of phase one is some potential size of customers who would pick your product over competitors. But we also had to assume 100% awareness and distribution, which is unrealistic. In the real world, awareness and distribution take a long time to build, and we need to incorporate this into our forecast. The question you need to ask as you head into phase two is, what is the path for reaching the product's potential. In order to do that, I will now take a theoretical detour to, and discuss two common distributions, data distributions, the S-curve and its cousin, the normal distribution. But first, let's talk about the S-curve. Those knowledgeable about statistics may be familiar with the S-curve, especially in the context of logistic regression. However, when it comes to forecasting, that is not the context I would like you to think about. The S-curve is also the cumulative distribution of the normal distribution. For example, this curve shows how intensive the sun is during the day hour by hour, while this curve on the right is the cumulative exposure to the sun, the total sun rays I would absorb if I sat all day under the sun. Now the true distributions look more like this, but the point is still the same. The cumulative distribution of the normal curve looks like an S-curve. The normal distribution as a function of time tends to reflect a period of beginning or ramp up, a period of intense activity, the peak, and a period of decline activity. Interestingly, the normal distribution and its cousin the S-curve are all around us. Here we see the growth 
of the sunflower plant. And we can clearly notice a slow ramp up at the beginning, a period of intense growth and a slow down after two and a half months. Children learning vocabulary follows the cumulative normal distribution. And artists' productivity follows the cumulative normal distribution. Here we see the works of Mozart, even though Mozart died young. The last dot, what's above the line is the year Mozart died, already suspecting his death as he continued to work around the clock. So what does this detour on the normal and S-curves have anything to do with forecasting? Everett Rogers hypothesized that new products get adopted according to a normal distribution that is a function of time. That the first adopters, the innovators, are promptly the first 2.5% of adopters, who then influence the next 13.5% called early adopters. After which an intense growth happens when the early majority adopt, which is called closing the chasm or tipping point. Rogers curves has been used for forecasting purposes thousands of times since the theory was published. However, there are several limitations. First, the model is based on a distribution about the mean time of adoption, which you really don't know until the whole adoption process is completed. In other words, you don't know if you're an early adopter until we've accounted for the early majority, late majority, and laggards. And only then can we designate what phase was at what point in time. Second, Rogers' curve makes the assumption that innovators can only adopt at the very beginning of the process. Empirical evidence, however, shows that innovators can adopt a product at any phase of the diffusion, although to a lesser degree. An objectively superior forecasting approach was developed by Frank Bass, in which he attributed product adoption to two main influences. One that is due to external influences, such as advertising or believing in the cause of the product, and obviously a larger impact in adoption at the beginning and tends to diminish with time, however. And the second one that is due to internal influences such as word of mouth, peer pressure, etc. Looking at the cumulative adoption curve, the equation to estimate cumulative sales has three unknowns. One, the size of the total market, or M, P, which is the coefficient of innovation, how big is the effect of external influencers, and Q, the coefficient of imitation, how big is the effect of internal influencers. Well, we know from our phase one research what the market potential is for our product. In fact, that is the whole reason we conducted phase one. What number do we use to find P and Q? Here I wish there was a handy technique that could calculate the most appropriate P and Q. Instead, what we have are standards and guidelines. A typical value for P is around 0.03, rarely, if ever, above 0.04, and often less than 0.01. Typical Q value, value, however, is around 0.38, with a range between 0.3 and 0.5. Finding the right figures does make a difference. The blue curve shows the uptake using the typical Q value of 0.38 and a typical P value of 0.03. However, changing Q to the upper limit of 0.5 will create the orange line, which will achieve a certain sales level many years quicker. Notice, however, that swings in the P value make less of a difference in the accuracy of the curve. So when it comes to using the P and Q values, here are some suggestions. First, take a look at historic product launches within the organization and try to fit a curve to them, adjusting the levels of P and Q. If there isn't much history, start out with typical values, 0.38 and 0.03. And it's always smart and helps save on heartburn medication if you create both conservative and liberal forecasts. And finally, keep track of sales and use the equation to continue to adjust your P and Q. As time goes on, what you'll find is eventually locking down on figures you feel good about. Hopefully, with all this information, you now feel more confident in helping your organization approach new product launches in a scientifically sound and robust way. First, quantifying the market appeal for your product and then using the best formula to find the path to that market potential. I hope this was helpful and you'll reach out to me if you have any further questions. Thank you.